Hi, Sophie Aldred here and I'm here at the Waldorf Hotel in central London and I'm going to meet up with somebody who it was my privilege to work with on my first ever Doctor Who story. She was a child star, she's an amazing actress, she's a wonderful person and somebody who I love to have as my friend. I don't know if you remember, but we used to have notes, didn't we? Where they, you know, they, where, and we'd have these runs where they'd come in and we'd do it in story order. Yes, I remember John Nathan Turner would sort of strut around with a cigar yes. and a cigarette. Can you imagine? Yeah, you I know. Couldn't do that now. And they'd time everything on uh, oh, all it was, the scenes with a stopwatch. Oh, you? I know. Right, and you, notes, and then you'd no get, one would say anything. Yes. And they wouldn't say anything to you. And then you'd have to be, you have to leave the room. And go and sit in that, you know, those other oh, little, yes, you know, yes, small little, little rehearsals. Yeah, with the phone you'd in. have to go and sit in there and wait while they discussed it, and then you'd go back in and be given the notes by the director, and they'd have left. That's it. I do remember yes. that being a bit weird. I also remember um, at that time as well. That was also the time when I was asked if I could scream. So that was I, my first experience of that was with Linda uh, Bellingham, Michael Jaston. Um, and doing all the trial stuff um, and doing a bit of the vervoid stuff, it must have been as well, because that was the time when I was asked to scream in the key of E flat. <laughs> I thought it was Great. a joke. Well, and I laughed. And if I was anyone like, can do it, you I was can like, do what? it. And then I realised they wanted it to blend with the theme tune. You know, it was like, yes, and it, ble it was hilarious. Fantastic. And I laughed at them, and they were like, they were very serious. <laughs> How did you get your note? I don't know. I think I asked for the. I think I asked for Somebody a bit of a note. Yeah. Ding. Yeah. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I know it was hilarious, um, and so that was that, and it was all quite serious. And I also remember um, being. Yeah, we went into one of those little rooms, and we were sat, uh, we sat there and with Colin as well, and he wasn't particularly happy. And we were in there for. I mean, like two hours sat there, and, they, and we said, well, can we go home? Because, I mean, no one rehearses beyond 4.30 at, at Acton at that point. It was everyone else had gone home. It was about six o'clock, and we were like, um, can we go home? Or do something? We, we need to leave. And um, no, no, we had to wait. We had to wait for the, uh, for, for, the, for the notes. For the notes. I wonder what was going on. Gosh. Oh, deep discussions. Mm. Deep discussions and not happy. You know, they were quite unhappy. Yeah. And then... So, but I do also remember um, doing, so we, we used to do the, the run-throughs for the, the team, you know, for the script editors and also, and also for, um, for John, as you say, and the story order and to make sure that that was all working correctly. But we'd also, do you remember doing the run-throughs for the crew so that the camera, yes. uh, uh, camera crew could come in and, and the director check what they were going to do? Yeah, they'd be coming up doing a lot of that. Like yeah. that yeah. He used to, he has, he'd never do it. We had a director like that on his right, and put your face. <laughs> and he'd come up. There was a director on his end who'd come up and would go, and he'd just appear from somewhere. And I mean, you don't <laughs> have time in it. End yeah, with somebody coming up and going, makes you go, oh, oh what are you doing? <laughs> go away. Um, and uh, so that always used to remind me of, 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 of Doctor Who with that. And we did one. Uh, we did one run through with, um, and it was Richard Briers and Clive Merrison. Who, oh, when you did Paradise oh, Towers. My God. And they was, uh, he, was, uh, they was, he was such a lovely man. And every time, I noticed during the rehearsal week, every time they would go and do their scenes and they would come back and sit at the table and Clive would say something to Richard like, um, it's got to be antiques, it's got to be antiques. And then he'd go off and do another scene and then he'd come back and go, no, I think uh, maybe a post office. What? <laughs> and after a while I'd go, I am I part, am I allowed to ask what are you talking about every time we come back? We're working out what we're going to have to do after we, if this goes out because we're going to have to change our careers and open a shop. So it was antiques, post office, stationery, something together. They decided they were going to because they just thought it was just so funny that they they just were never going to be able to to deal with this. Anyway. They came, they did this run through and the crew were absolutely in hysterics with Richard talking to his pulsating brain because he did this whole stuff as the caretaker going down going, oh, right, my lovely, oh, you know, oh, yes, you mustn't talk like that. Of course, he was hilarious. He was the most wonderful comedy actor. 
Well, he got given notes afterwards and told not to be so funny and that he had to be more serious and he got kept back. And he had to be rehearsed. Naughty Richard Bryan. And you Bryans. go, Richard Bryan's being given notes about not to be so funny. That's brilliant. Come on, my Was love. Was that the next story then that you recorded? Can you remember? Oh, after Time gosh. in the Rani? I think it probably was. Yeah, I think it's Time in the Rani and then the Paradise Towers because mm. then I had to do all that stuff in the swimming pool. Yes. Oh, no, oh, I don't know. Yes, it was. I'm trying to think of directors. I'm trying to remember of the directors. That was such a sweet director, was that? Because I had to do this swimming pool scene. Nick Mallet, lovely Nick, Nick Mallet. Oh, yes. he was lovely. And I'm going to be interviewing the eighth doctor himself, Mr. Paul McGann. We're going to go and have a bit of a chat later on. But first of all, I've got a few duties to perform at this convention. Come on, chaps. I want to know about Doctor Who now. Had I you... was in that. <laughs> I you? think I was in that once. <laughs> Had you watched Doctor Who as a kid? Yeah, we, we, yeah. We, um, I remember Hartnell, you know. And the kids loved Hartnell. He was like, you know, kids my age. We, you know, he, he was my doctor. You know, I was a kid in the 60s. There he was. Um, I can remember the changeover to, to Troughton. Um, and was it a family thing? Did you watch it Well, together? everybody watched everything. And it was on when you came home from school. Because there was only three channels, everybody saw everything anyway. Even if you didn't like it, you watched it. You know, and, and you'd go into school the day after and whatever it had been on the night before, the kids would be reenacting it in the playground anyway. So if you'd missed it, you saw it. Because um, the kids had acted out for you. So I remember a lot of that. Um, and there was something really... I mean, Bill Hartnell, when you think he was only 50, early 50s, but he seemed like 110. Yeah. He was like, he was a Victorian gentleman or something. They had the long white hair and this, this figure. There were, in those days, there were these cough suites called hacks. And, they, and in, in the older shops, they'd be in these big jars and tins. And there was a picture of an Alf fellow with white hair. And he's in mid-sneeze. It was this really good, uh-huh, you know. Uh, and he looked like Bill Arton. I mean, it's, it's the fellow off the hacks tin, you know, uh, was Doctor Who. And it was exciting. And I remember that. And I remember th that the Doctor had a family. And I remember thinking, you know, and the, and the, and the episodes were short, weren't they? And, and kind of punchy. I liked that. I wasn't a fan. I wouldn't say, yeah, I'm a, a Who fan. Um, but we were all fans just by, by dint of being around, you know, by, by association, we were. And then by the time, say, Sylvester got the part, were you aware of him doing it? I knew he was doing it. Um, you know, this is the 80s, then I'm in London, I'm working myself. Um, I didn't watch it, I stopped. Uh, the way we were living, you know, we, we lived in communal houses and squats and everything else. Telly was often the last thing on your mind. You didn't watch telly. Um, and also, being in theatre, people yeah, don't yeah, really yeah, realise, yeah, yeah. so you, yeah. you don't get to watch. I can remember seeing telly. Peter. I remember, um, um, Colin, I don't remember at all. Colin Baker. Peter, I remember a bit, I think, because of the costume. I remember watching you. Um, I'm wondering if you were married or not. But that's understood. <laughs> that's so bizarre. I remember because... Mark saying, I thought you were in love with Lulu, you know, from the 60s. I'm going, no, I'm over Lulu now. It's Ace, you know. Um, that's so funny because simultaneously I was watching the Monocle Mutineer in my flat, in my squat, actually, in Lewisham. And I remember this is such a visceral memory. Um, and it's only ever happened like a few times in my life where I've just watched TV and just gone, oh, you know, I'm in love with this guy and I'll never meet him. Look at that. You know, Isn't that funny? life could have turned out a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, if only it? we'd known. Thank hey? God no one introduced us. God. Just say no, kids. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, moving on. Um, when you. How did you hear about Doctor Who? Is it something that. Me and the of people auditioned for it, didn't well, they? Well, Doctor Who disappeared, didn't it? In 89, yeah. it was off anyway yeah, we and gone. It off. I remember that. I remember that really well. Mm -hmm. It's over. But it was over for a couple of years before it was over, you know, because you knew it, they were running it down. Um, and it seemed sensible. Or, 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 you know, nobody seemed to make a lot of... I don't remember people complaining much. It was, it was an acceptance that it had been there since 63, it, been, it had a good run, and now it was over. And when it was over, it was over. And it had gone, and McCoy had disappeared, and... Um, 
you know, 89 became 1990. Suddenly you're into the 90s and a few years in, you know, three, four years after that, um, suddenly like rumours are circulating again. I remember that as well. Mm. Um, that they're going to bring it back. I'm thinking, why would you want to... Who's going to bring it back? How could the BBC make such a vault fast and bring it back? And, you know, it didn't seem feasible. And then, and then people were saying, well, you know, it, uh, it's going to be in America, you know. Someone American, uh, someone an American wants to do it, and then, and then we were hearing rumours that um, Eric Idle is going to be the doctor and stuff. You could kind of, you know, it was feasible. You think, oh really? Okay, yeah, I can see that. You know, in that Idle was in keeping with this idea of, you know, like McCoy, he was a dramatic actor, but he was a good comedian, and you know, it seemed to fit. Uh, Rowan Atkinson and. and you know, and around that time, in 94, me and the brothers, all of us, worked together for the one and only time we worked together on the telly. And we did a, we did a, 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 a series, a big thing, called The Hanging Gale. It was a big BBC serial, the biggest thing that year, um, in Ireland. It was out of BBC Northern Ireland. And I played, it was an Irish famine story, and I, and I was the, I, we, we played a family of brothers, and I was the priest, you know, the lad in the family they'd sent up to the priesthood. And I was dressed in this um, frock coat, long hair, um, looking plainly doctorish. Mm. I'm beginning to see. And because um, he told me this was true, I know it's true, Phil Siegel was watching it somewhere, going, who he... He's my doctor, I want him. And that's, how, that's, that's when they rang me up. And it took him, and them, him particularly, because really it was under his aegis. It was, it was his energy, really, as I remember, um, around that time that got the thing that we made, uh, you know, in 96, that got it made, got those people together, got Fox and Universal, the BBC to sort of backtrack and get involved. Um, and it was true, what was true was that it was going to take place in America. Um, he said, do you want to, and I was, I went, I read for it. I, I went in and read for it. And what, and what I didn't know is that my brother Mark also read for it. I think that's because Siegel couldn't tell us apart, <laughs> physically apart. He, he wasn't sure which one it had been. So they got both of us in, um, which kind of stands to reason. Um, and then I remember not wanting to do it. I didn't want to do it. Did Mark want to do it? I don't remember. We never talked about it. Um, and I didn't want to do it. I said, no, 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 no. I, well, no, I thought Eric Idle was doing it. He said, no, man, uh, what, what, what do you want me? I'm not a comedian. He said, I know. I said, no, I'm, a, I'm a, like a, I'm a, whatever. You know, and presumably... I'm a straight actor. And it took him months and months and months to persuade me to do it. This was quite a commitment as well, because not only did you have to go and do the... Because it was at all intents and purposes a sort of working pilot, wasn't it? It was a pilot, for yeah. to tell you. I'd never done such a thing. I'd never shot a pilot. I'd never worked in North America. And this was going to be... It was going to be a pilot in Vancouver. Um... But of course, you know, to do a pilot, you need to sign a contract. And it's, and it's a standard pilot contract. And the contract basically says, you know, that if this thing is successful, that is, if it goes to series, you are on it. You belong to them for six years. It was a six-year thing. It's all one-sided. If it doesn't go, you, you, it's sayonara. You're out in your, out in your ear. Um, so would that have necessitated you moving out there for six years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah.